you shed your blood So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone I won't be shackled to the way I was So I'm gonna live like my chains are gone No shadow, come on, lift your voice, that has ever overcome your life, and there is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us, every battle you've already won, we've already won. Come on, this is a new song tonight. Catch on and sing it along with us. There is no weapon, come on. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. And there is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, or you've already won. Show me waters he can't part. He's the God. 
all of my fear I will turn into praise Shake off despair as I sing out your name A victory dance I will dance out in faith He will crush disappointment and break every chain Oh, all of my fear I will turn into praise Shake off despair as I sing out your name A victory dance I will dance out in faith will crush disappointment and break every chain oh, all of my fear i will turn into pain shake off despair as i sing out your name Lift our voice one more time. Let's sing that together. You show me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. You show me one thing that's too high. Show me waters he can't pipe. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible, is possible. Come on, pray with me tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, that uh, all things are possible through you. God, that as we come tonight, uh, we just come with a, an attitude and a spirit of expectancy. God, that uh, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, God, that you are with us that you are for us, that you've always been with us, and that you've always been for us. So God, I pray tonight for students that may be in here tonight and feeling overwhelmed or anxious or God, defeated or lonely. God, I pray that uh, as we are here tonight, that we can be encouraged by one another's presence. God, that over the last year, we faced some tough times. God, so I just pray tonight for just the easing of those tough times. God, that as we walk back into a season that maybe has some sor sort of normalcy to it, God, that you would be with us. God, I pray tonight for folks that may be watching uh, with us online. God, that they would feel encouraged tonight, that they would feel um, inspired tonight, not by anything we do, but God, because of who you are. So God, I just pray uh, that as your people, that we come together uh, for this time of celebration, time of uh, lifting our voice, time of reading uh, your word, got time of communion. So tonight I just pray that you are with us and you are for us in all that we say and do. In your name, amen. Amen. Hey, we're about to move into a time of communion. You can have a seat as we walk through this time as Bella leads us. Um, for those of you who are new here today or you need a refresher, we do communion in remembrance of Jesus and everything he's done for us. Um, the bread represents his body broken for us on the cross and the juice for his blood poured out for us and the sacrifices he gave for us because of his tremendous love for us. Um, so whenever you're ready, you can take the bread and the juice. I want to thank you all for coming here today and um just want to pray for you guys and um, i hope that everyone who walks through that door 
has their hearts opened and that um, you receive Jesus and you receive the word today and that um, this brings you closer to him as you remember him and everything that he's done for us and all his sacrifices because he loves us so much and he only wants the best for us. And whenever you're ready, stand up and worship with us. tonight. That out tonight. Here I stand. Here I stand. High and surrender. I need you now. Hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Here I stand. Here I stand. High and surrender. I need you now. Hold my heart.
for bringing everyone in this room today. Thank you that we're here and we can worship you, and we can praise you, and hear about your glory and your grace. Thank you for blessing us each and every day, and for all the sacrifices you gave to us, and for sending your one and only son on the cross to die for us, and to just give so much love into our lives and into our hearts. And I hope that every student opens their hearts to the message today and that um, everyone comes out a better person and closer to you and um, more grateful to you and that they learn something valuable here today. In your son's name I pray, amen. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Amen, amen. Hey, welcome back to Pantano students. We are glad that you are here tonight. Hey, how many of you came out to uh, the parking lot party last week? Raise your hand real high. We had several of you that came out, and not only did you come out, but you invited your friends. Uh, we have been so blessed to see some of your friends. Last week, uh, last Friday, we got to uh, play a little nine square in the air. Raise your hand if you made it to the center square. Come on. Where are my winners at? Where are my winners? For those of you that don't have your hands up, that means that you are losers. I'm just joking. Um, that was my first time playing Nine Square, and I was encouraged by the way I played Nine Square. I'm just going to be honest with you. I mean, my Nine Square skills didn't nearly match my ping pong skills. Right, Cody? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm still, listen, I'm still undefeated at the ping pong table in this building. Just want to say that. Not bragging. For, for now, for now, for now. For now, that leads in very well to uh, the message tonight. Hey, tonight we're going to begin a whole new sermon series called Samson. And if you don't know anything about the character Samson in the Old Testament, uh, his life has a lot to speak to each and every one of us. Because Samson was a dude that had tremendous strength, but at the end of the day, he ended up being super weak when it came to his will when it came to his love and fervor for God, he gave in. Uh, he gave in when God had given him truly everything. God had prepared his life for great things, but Samson said, "You know what? That's not enough." I want to begin tonight with this uh, with this passage out of Ezekiel chapter twenty-two. If you don't know the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, Ezekiel was a prophet. And uh, he would go around speaking uh, to God's people, the Israelites. And the whole Old Testament is really a time that the Israelites struggled. Most of the time they struggled and they failed. And Ezekiel was seeking for righteous men that would stand up, that would do the right thing because it is right, that would stand up and do the right thing because they were seeking after God. See, I believe over the next four weeks that we're looking at this series in Samson, I want to challenge you and encourage you 
men, young men, young women, to stand up and do the right thing because it's right. Because it's what God is desiring in your life. That I believe out of this series that some of you may feel a, a heart and an attitude of leadership in a whole new way. But in this verse out of Ezekiel, it's very tragic. It's almost pretty sad if, when, when you read it in context. It says this in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. It says, I looked for a man among them. So Ezekiel talking to the Israelites, God's people. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land, on behalf of the promised land, the land that God had promised them so I would not have to destroy it. It says, I looked, but I found none. I want you to focus on those words. I'm going to highlight them there for you. It says, I looked for someone, but I found no one. You see, life is full of decisions for each and every one of us. We can decide if we're going to follow after God, if we're going to go after God with our whole heart, with all that we are, or we're just going to hold some back. And most of the time in the Old Testament, you see the Israelites holding things back from God and things get in the way of their relationship with God, their Father. And tonight as we jump into this this series, as we look at this verse from Ezekiel, I mean, if we put it into some modern day context, Ezekiel is saying, I'm looking for a man that has integrity. I'm looking for a man that has courage. I'm looking for a man that will stand up for others who can't stand for themselves. I'm looking for a servant. I'm looking for somebody that's going to do right because it is completely right. Tonight, as we begin this series in Samson, Samson, uh, from the beginning of his days, and we'll get into his story in just a little bit, in case you don't know his story, his story is found in the book of Judges, which is in the Old Testament, from chapters 13 to 16. Samson was a judge that God had ordained and God had put into place. And just today, we're going to do a little overview of chapter 13. Samson was a strong man. In fact, uh, he was the mightiest among all men in his time. And his accomplishments are legendary. But his weaknesses are even more legendary. And that's his demise. And that's, his, uh, that's the heart of his story. Uh, there's some stories in the Bible that are like, like David and Goliath. Oh, I love David and Goliath. Because it, it ends in victory. But for Samson, his story really, truly, personally ends in his defeat. Samson had so much God-given potential. I mean, God-given from his birth, but he squandered it all. See, Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. And that's, that's you and I every day. We all have decisions to make every day. Some of you had tests this week, and you can decide, do I want to be honest in my test giving and my test taking, or do I just want to cheat a little bit? Do I want to, uh, do I want to be honest in this situation, or do I want to take the easy road around this thing? So tonight, we're going to look at Judges chapter 13. I'm going to give you kind of a, a big overview of Samson's life, kind of give you an underlying understanding of who he was. Uh, Samson was a man that was born because of God's will and intent. Uh, when, you read through, when you read through Judges, uh, the, the, an angel of the Lord comes uh, to Samson's parents who were unable to have kids. These two were unable to have kids, and they say, you're going to have a kid. You're going to have a son. Uh, but more than anything, we want this son to be set apart to help deliver the people of Israel. We want him to be set apart. We want him to be holy and righteous before God. Uh, so uh, they followed after. Uh, there was a, a thing in the Old Testament. If you look into Numbers chapter 6, there was a, uh, a, a thing called the Nazarite vows. So uh, the Nazarite vows. And if you know anything about the Bible... Uh, Jesus was what? He was a Nazarite. He was Jesus of Nazarene. So Samson is coming from that same lineage. And this Nazarite vow, uh, the angel of the Lord says, we want him to be set apart. We want him to be different. 
He must be different because he will deliver his people. And really, when you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, you can see a little bit of similarity between Samson and Jesus. But honestly, they're so different at the end of their story. But the Nazarite vow was this thing. They had to follow, uh, Samson had to follow three things within his life. Three things. And there were three, three rules, three vows that they, they, that they made uh, for Samson's life. And the first one was this, is that Samson could not get at any point in his life drunk. Don't get drunk. You're to honor me with all of your body, your heart, your mind, your soul, and you're not to drink anything that is fermented. The second thing is that he could not touch anything that was dead. This meant dead people, dead animals, dead things, okay? Uh, I don't know why, but that was one of the vows that he was making. Uh, no, not even meat. Absolutely, not even meat. They were um, not meat eaters, as you look in the Old Testament. Uh, and the third thing is, is that he could not get his hair cut. He could not get his hair cut, meaning he would look like Stephen Faxon, right? Everybody take a look back there at Stephen. Steve, go ahead and take, Stephen, take the mask. Give me, a, give the hat. Like, we want to see what a Samson, give it a shake. Give it a, just give it a quick, yeah, just give, give it a quick shake. Yeah, yeah, something like, I believe Samson might have looked something like my brother Stephen back there, just wild and wooly and just all over the place, um, you know, he couldn't cut it at all. This, this meant like, it wasn't like a, he could have a little party in the back and business on the top, you know. It was, this, this came back in 2020, and I don't know why this trend came back. But uh, listen, I can guarantee Samson did not have a mullet. Like, that, that is an intent. I told Stephen that he needs to get a mullet. I think, I think Faxon needs a strong mullet. Uh, he needs a strong mullet in his life. I can guarantee that Samson never looked like this dude because this is unholy and this is not right. Listen, guys, if you're in this room and you feel like the mullet is your next hair phase, just say no. Just, just walk away from it. You don't want to be 30 one day, one day and have pictures of yourself in a mullet. It would not be good. Trust me with that. Now, you, you might ask, what's up with the hair? Why the hair thing? And here's the hair thing. The hair was a symbol. This, the hair was an outward expression of this inward commitment in his life. Kind of like baptism, right? We are outwardly, we, we go and we are baptized physically. It's this outward expression of our in, inward feeling. Kind of like uh, I'm married, so I wear this wedding ring, which is just a piece of rubber, actually, uh, which is amazing. Uh, I revolutionized my life when I got this rubber wedding ring. It's great, but um, anyhow. Side note, uh, outward symbol, outward symbol of an inward commitment to my wife. Um, so, but all through his life, as we read through Samson's story, he struggles with some of these commitments that his parents raise him up in. And we're going to watch, and through his, through his life, we're going to watch Samson do some pretty stupid things. Now, what I want you to get out of this series is this going to be really easy to internalize this and say, this is, Samson's a man, so this is something that men struggle with more than women or more than young ladies. This is, you know, this is a man struggle, but I'm going to tell you tonight that Samson's attitude, the attitudes of his heart are something that I think we all deal with. Because really at the end of the day, it is the attitude of our heart our life, the life that we get to live every day. And we make decisions and choices on how we're going to live that. And tonight in, in this chapter, in chapter 13 or chapter 14, we're going to look at some attitudes of Samson's heart that I think um, show him to be very weak. And then we're going to talk about what the opposite attitude might look like within our own lives as we try to learn from the mistakes that Samson made in the book of Judges and we try to have a a different attitude within our own life. So Samson's life, tonight we're going to talk about it, three ways, three very specific attitudes um, that he showed to be very weak. And those three things are this. Um, Samson had these three attitudes in his heart. He had an attitude of lust. 
He had an attitude of entitlement, and he had an attitude of pride. And all across this room, I can guarantee each and every one of us at different times in our life can fall into any of these, these three categories. We can have an attitude of lust. And you might say, what is lust? What is lust? Lust is that attitude that says, I want it. I want it. I have to have it. I need to get it. Most of the time, people think that lust is just like this physical thing, like, oh, you know, look at that chick or look at that dude. Uh, but it's not always that. I mean, when, when the new iPhone comes out, whatever that is, whenever that is, who knows? I've got like an iPhone 7 or something like that. Uh, I'm so behind the times. Um, do you lust after it? Do you say, oh, I want it. I got to have it. I need it. You know, my wife, my wife bought me uh, these AirPods for my birthday. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Thank you, sweetie, if you're in the room. Thank you for the birthday present. But this was not something I looked at and said, man, I got to have those. But some of you might be like, those are cool. I could take those. I could have those, Pastor Jerry. Like, I could do something with those, which I have valued these, driving down the road and being able to put them in my ears and talk to people on the phone legally. And it's been great. But lust, that attitude of saying, I need to have it. I got it. I got to have this. And sometimes we can all slip into that attitude. No matter the new things, no matter, it might, it might be that physical thing of looking at young ladies or young men in your school like, oh, you're good looking. I got to have you. And that's, as tonight, tonight as we look at Samson's story, that's, that's where he struggled. He struggled with the physical. Let's read, uh, let's read, let's, let's just jump into uh, Judges chapter 14. And we'll see, this, we'll see this attitude growing up in Samson. It says, Samson went down to Timnah, which was a town not too far from his town. And he saw there a young Philistine woman, a smoking hot Philistine woman. Okay, that's what he saw. That was his attitude. Now, here's the thing about the Philistines. The Philistines were his enemy in the Old Testament. The Israelites and the Philistines did not get along. In fact, if you know the story of David and Goliath, David was an Israelite. Goliath was a Philistine. So they've been enemies for generations. And it says, when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a smoking hot Philistine woman in Timnah. Now go get her for me as my wife. And his father and mother replied, but Samson said to his father, Go ahead, and flip, yeah, go ahead and flip the next slide. Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. And his parents did not know that this uh, was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. So not only are they his enemy, they are enslaving the Israelites. And remember, Samson's supposed to be the one that rises up to help conquer Israel this enemy, okay? So he has this attitude, this attitude of I want this Philistine woman. I saw it, I want it, she's good. She's the one. She's gonna be my wife. So he leaves his town and he tells his parents this is gonna be the one. They don't believe it, but he says, you know what, mom, I don't care what you think. You know what, dad, I don't care what you think. I'm going to go get what I want. And there's a, a lustful attitude and a lustful heart there. Because it's not just against, against mom and dad. It's actually when you look in the Old Testament uh, laws and, 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 and guidelines, it, it is they are not to intermarry with other cultures. So there was, there was some specific things that Samson shouldn't have ran after. And over and over again, we see this in Samson's life, in his story. Like, his attitude of lust wasn't just this one time. We see it again and again. Because here's the thing with attitudes. Most of the time, attitudes start small, and sometimes they get so big, they engulf us, and they swallow us alive. So I want you to see that 
attitude. The second attitude we talked about is that uh, uh, Samson had a spirit of entitlement about his life. Not only do I want it, but I deserve it. I deserve it. Like, I'm a strong man, and I work hard, and, and I do all of these things. I deserve this woman in my life. Notice this in verse 5 as the story pro- progresses. It says, Samson went down to Timnah uh, together with his father and his mother, and as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward them. Now, they're in a different kind of hood than we're in, right? We might have javelina and some, like, uh, mountain lions or bobcats. How many of you have ever seen mountain lions or bobcats out on trails? How many of you pooped your pants when you saw the mountain lion or bobcat? Anybody? Anybody honestly want to say that? Um, listen, it's a scary thing when you see, like, a big paw print and you're out in the wilderness walking around. Like, it's a scary thing. But notice what Samson does. It says, uh, he, he sees this lion come roaring toward him, and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Now, I've never torn a young goat or a young lion apart, and I don't know the kind of strength that it would take, but I'm going to tell you that Samson had to be somewhat strong. But notice that it said the spirit of the Lord came upon him. But he told neither his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and he talked with the woman and he liked her. Look at your neighbor and say, I like you. <laughs> Listen, Samson's like was a little bit different. He was a little bit different. Uh, but Samson had the power to do this. He's going along one day, this lion jumps out and he just rips it to shreds. Now, look in verse 8. It says, sometime later. We don't know what sometime uh, sometime is, but sometime later, when he went back, after he saw this woman, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside and to look at this lion that he had ripped apart sometime before. He went to look at the carcass. He went to say, man, I killed that thing. You know, here's, some, here's something, just a little side note. Most of the time in our life when we get sidetracked, when we begin to do things that we shouldn't do, I want you to look at those three words. It says that he turned aside. He went a way that he shouldn't have been going. Like he was going, A, to this woman that he liked, but then he turned aside to look at something. Now, I want you to remember the, the, remember the uh, Nazarite vows. Remember what they were? They were, don't. Get drunk, don't touch anything dead, and don't get your hair cut. But notice what he does. It says, um, it says he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. So this lion had been dead for some time. So these bees are taking up inhabitants inside this lion. And he, as the scripture says that he scooped out the honey with his hand, and he ate it as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Okay, two things real quick. First of all, that's really gross. I mean, think about a dead animal, maybe a dead javelina, that some bees, like, take inhabitants in for so long that they've now got some honeycomb built up. And I mean, think about how gross that is. Not only is he getting the honey, but he's probably getting some rotten lion guts or lion things. Um, you know, here, here's the thing, ladies. Uh, guy, guys are gross, and we do gross things. We do disgusting things at times. Like, you get a group of guys together, and more than likely, uh, it's going to become like an eating competition Maybe sometimes like a farting competition. Like there's, there's like we do gross stuff. If you're a guy in this room, you know what I'm talking about. Like we want to see who can eat the hottest wings. Like Chris, Chris does these competitions. Who can eat the hottest wings? Who can eat the most pizza? Right? We, we, we Yeah. Guys are the guys that are like, hey, let's get a spoonful of cinnamon and see who can swallow it. Like, that's, 
we do stupid things. We do stupid things. It's nasty. What, what Samson did is nasty. But remember, what was he not supposed to touch? Dead things. Dead things. So, so he goes against God's will again. He breaks, he breaks his vow. The same God that has given him the power to rip this lion apart, he now breaks the vow, the covenant that he had, all for the sake of a handful of honey. Now, I want you to think about that in our life tonight. How often, how often do we do things that oppose God's will just for something that we think is sweet? Just for something that we think is what I need. This is what I need right now. And I want to encourage you in this tonight to begin to look at your heart like, God, what I want to do is the right thing. I want to be the man or the woman that you're looking for to stand in the gap. I want to be the man or the woman that you're looking for to be righteous, to do the right thing because it's right. So Samson, he had this attitude of lust. I want it. He had this attitude of entitlement. I deserve it. I'm, I'm good enough. Like, I, des- I deserve this thing. But he also had this attitude of pride that he could handle it. I can handle it. Like, I can do this on my own. Like, I don't need, I really, I don't need the power of God. I can do this on my own. I can do this on my own. I can handle it. I'm strong. Notice Judges chapter 14, verse 10. It says this. It says, now his father went down to see the woman, this woman that he uh, had the hots for. And there was Samson holding a feast as it was customary. He was about to get married, so he's holding a feast. And really, when you look this up in the, in the Hebrew, this word feast, uh, it comes from this word uh, mishta, which means really to party. So Samson is throwing himself a party a celebration, and we all know what happens at parties, especially in this day. The, there was probably wine flowing, and they were probably drinking a ton. And what was the third thing that Samson wasn't supposed to do? He wasn't supposed to get drunk. So he's doing something, again, that opposes the will of God within his life. Now, at the end of the story, as we get to week four, we're going to look at Samson. And ultimately, his life would come to a demise, and he would be uh, killed by his, really, by his own power and his own strength. After he's had his eyes gouged out, after he's, before all of his enemies being mocked because he did things that opposed the will of God. But before we go tonight, those were three attitudes that he had that made him weak. But I just want to look at the counterparts for us, like what we can learn what we can take away tonight, what we can apply to our life, that he wanted things, that he felt like he deserved things, that he felt like he could handle things on his own. But the three things for us to, to, to take away is that, uh, and here's the first attitude that I think we should have, young people today, is that we can have an attitude that says, I want something, but I want God. I want God in my life. I need God in my life. I desire to connect with my creator in my life. That God has prepared the way for my life. Maybe I will never be as physically strong as Samson, but I want to be as spiritually strong, or much spiritually stronger than who Samson was. That we hunger and thirst for the things of God. And the second one is this. Uh, you know, as we walk through life, there are many things that we feel like we deserve, but truly the thing that uh, we have deserved since the fall of Adam is that we deserve death. And Scripture says in Romans 6, 23, that the, the wages of sin is death. And the reality for all of us is that we all sin, and we all fall short of God's glory. But through the power and authority of Jesus in our life, we are given life. John 10, 10 says that Jesus has come to give us life and life to the, anybody know? Life to the full. Like give us the fullest of life. We deserve death, but Jesus comes to give us life. And the third thing is that 
the reality that I can't handle anything without God. Sure, there are times that I try to act in my own strength and do my own thing, but really, when it comes down to it, I've got to look to God for his power, his authority, his direction in my life. So as we walk through this series over the next few weeks, next week, uh, next week Caleb is going to come bring a message. The following week, Cody's going to bring a message, and then Pastor Amy's going to bring the final message. But I want to encourage you in this, that I truly believe that here at Pantano Students, we have a room full of young leaders that can lead the way in your generation. But will you act in your own power, your own authority, or will you lean in to what God wants for your life? Will you have an attitude that says, I want God. I want God. I know that I deserve death, but he brings me life. And I can't do this on my own. I can't do it on my own. So for the next few weeks, we're going to look a little bit more and a little bit more into this man named Samson and learn from his story to impact our story. Hey, let's pray tonight. Let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our hearts. Some of you in here tonight, you're facing uh, big things. Here we are at the end of school year. Maybe you're facing temptation, struggles, hurts, pains. Maybe you face struggles with lust on a daily basis, issues with uh, looking at things that you shouldn't be looking at doing things that you shouldn't be doing. My prayer for you tonight is that you would look and say, God, tonight I want you. I want to lean into who you are in my life. And I know that I can't do that on my own. And God, I know that I deserve death, but you give me life through your son, Jesus. Maybe for the first time, it's, it's saying, Jesus, I love you. I invite you into my heart, into my life into my story. Jesus, will you come make a difference in me and who I am and what I do? Maybe it's not you are here and you struggle just like Samson with pride. I can handle it on my own. I don't need anybody else. And that all sounds good. But there will be times in your life that you hit walls and you realize that being lonely is not the place that you want to be. So in that same instance, to to lean in to who God is and who Jesus is within your life, that, that we can do all things, but it's not through anything that we do. It's through everything that Jesus has already done. So Father, tonight we just pray over our students. We pray, oh God, over uh, uh, the rest of this year. God, as we press toward the end of the year, God, that you would give us the strength to lean into you. God, that it's been such a long year. But more importantly, Jesus, that you know right where we're at tonight. So I pray that as we break out and go to groups, God, that you would be a part of our discussion, that there may be some of us in this room that deal with lust and temptation and things daily. And God, that we can be open and honest enough, vulnerable enough to say, you know what, this is a struggle in my life, that I look, uh, I look with my eyes way too much, and I, I forget my heart, and I forget the, the life that God has called me to. So, Father, I pray for encouragement tonight. I pray, God, that uh, there would be just some uh, awesome discussion of, uh, of this is a weakness. Now, can I lean into Jesus, you, and help me uh, to be stronger in my walk? God, I pray that you would go with us in all that we say and do. In your name we pray. Amen.